then next month we're gonna uh, continue our theme around Six Sigma Summer and Bob Simes from ADEC, although he's worked at various companies around this area, is gonna talk about reduction of variation around a target. So without further ado, um, I'm about to hand it over to Brian. Any questions about Lean Portland or comments? All right, over to you, Brian. We're gonna talk about control charts and specifically these out of control conditions and what to look for in a control chart. So a little background on myself first before we jump right in. Um, my background was in uh, statistics and quality in school. Don't know how I landed in that. I just, those are the classes I didn't do poorly in. And so I just said, well, I better just stick with this. Um, and the quality management and productivity course was uh, actually it's another thing I stumbled into. So I was looking to take some grad school classes and it really was more like a Six Sigma program, but they just didn't call it that at the time. This was, you know, late 1990s. So it had been out, but they just didn't use that naming convention. But as I look back, that's kind of what I learned. And then there's a little bit of lean in there with the productivity part. So it's pretty interesting. I started a job at Rockwell Collins in Iowa and worked there 18 years at different sites, including the last site I worked at, which is in Wilsonville, Oregon. And that's how I knew um, and got tied in Lean Portland quite a bit. Um, went through some different certifications like quality engineer and then Six Sigma Black Belt and a Lean Master program we had at Rockwell and then Six Sigma Master Black Belt right before I went into consulting. And I've been doing that for about six years now and um, moved out of Portland in late 2020, and now I'm down in South Florida, technically in Pompano Beach, if you know where that's at, just north of Fort Lauderdale. So today we're gonna cover what is SBC and what are control charts, and then we'll spend a lot of time deep diving into rules of the control charts. Um, so I'll start kind of high level, and then we'll deep dive, might get a little nerdy, and then we'll kind of wrap it up with why is this good and also tie back to, you know, a little bit on the lean concept and talk about why Toyota does or does not use control charts. So I hope to have some discussion at the end too. So first let's talk about SPC. Um, it's a method for applying statistical methods to monitor and control the quality of a process. Usually it's a production process. It's typically used in manufacturing, but it's not limited to that, but I'd say a um, large majority of the application is in uh, manufacturing. The two primary purposes is first to kind of understand is if your process is consistent and stable. And so the definition is that you have the same average and the same standard deviation over time. So if your average is the same and standard deviation is about the same, then it would be a stable process. But if your average moves around, meaning your process is moving around too much, then that means your process might be unstable. And that means your, your variability and your process moves around and that's probably gonna cause problems in your process. You might see higher defect rates or worse yields and that's gonna waste a lot of time and money. And then once you have a process established, you can set up a control chart to monitor it to help you find new problems. So if something happens to your process, um, let's say, something gets messed up with a piece of equipment, uh, the process might tell you that something's wrong without you having to know that. It's so, um, so once we have this up and running, you can early detect problems in a process much faster than you can if you're just waiting for failures or rejects to come through. It also helps you reduce variation in a process by studying the patterns in the data, and it can help you highlight um, things that are happening in the process that could be controlled or monitored or standardized a little bit better. And overall, if you do those, that can actually reduce the lead time of a process because you don't have to spend as much time inspecting. And that will lower the chance of rework or failures in the process because you've taken out some of the variability. So those are some good reasons why this is a, a helpful technique. And the key tool of uh, SPC is called a control chart. And this is the basics of how a control chart is set up, set up. And so those black dots represent different data points. And 
they has established lines called control limits set at about three standard deviations from the average. And if you go outside of that range, it's considered a special cause situation or an outlier. And if you're inside of there, then we see that the process is exhibiting typical or common variation in the process. Your process is always going to have variation. So usually the three standard deviations allows for that normal fluctuation in the process. But if it goes outside of that, that's usually a, a signal that maybe something's not right. You have uh, something went wrong. And that's the first indication we might detect of that. And you plot the data points over time as the process is running and you check to see if everything looks okay. And if it looks okay, then you feel confident that your process is running good. And if it starts showing strange patterns or signals like that, then it might tell you that something's not right in the process and we should go investigate. So that's the, the idea behind the control chart. And those limits are established based on past data. So usually you collect data for a certain amount of time and you calculate these control limits and then you lock those into your process. Okay, so that's the basic structure. So let's watch a really, really old video on how control charts are used um, with Frito-Lay and how they make potato chips. I think we're all familiar with potato chips. Making potato chips is a carefully controlled process. Actually, it's several processes, all involving human labor and complex machinery. So how does Frito-Lay know when and where they have a problem? In the past, a company would inspect the product at the end of the process. But that's a little late to know if something's wrong. There are better ways. Sampling, as we saw in an earlier program, is one way to check on the process as it's happening. But as it turns out, it's only the beginning. Frito-Lay is one of the many American companies to add a new tool to their production line, Statistical Process Control, or SPC for short. It's a way for people directly involved in a process to know when to make changes and when not to. SPC is becoming universally accepted in American business, but it took a while to catch on. I was a little fearful of the whole thing, not, not being totally familiar with statistics. It was something new to me, so there was a certain amount of reluctance on my part. Uh, but I soon became a believer once we started the process. Our variability from bag to bag diminished. Uh, we've probably made a 50% improvement in variability since we've instituted SPC in our operation. Statistical process control is made at critical control points in the process where you can actually impact the quality of the product. And by setting up statistical control charts or Schuhart charts, you can obtain signals that tell you when the process needs attention and when the process is best left alone. Let's look at the production of ruffles to see how statistical process control works. Every 15 minutes, Karen Engels collects three batches of finished ruffles for salt analysis. Salt content is a delicate balance for Frito-Lay. It has to be great enough to achieve the desired flavor, but small enough to satisfy consumer health concerns. To check on the salting process, each batch of chips is ground up, weighed, dissolved in distilled water, and filtered into a beaker. The electronic salt analyzer gives a precise readout of the percentage of salt. This sample salt content is 1.9%, just slightly greater than the target amount of 1.6. Karen repeats the process with the other two batches. The information is then collected by Barbara Boudreau for further analysis. Barbara averages the salt content of the three batches and comes up with the sample mean. She plots the mean on this control chart, a special kind of graph which lets her know when the salting process is out of control. Pretty awesome video, huh? I think it's early 80s. Is that like an early how it's made? Yeah, I think it was. Not quite as cool, but uh, yeah, it's getting there. Yeah, I think um, 
what we saw there is traditionally how it was trained and taught. So remember in the early 80s, there was a big push on quality. And so a lot of companies started to look at these tools of process control and see that they could control their variation and their process much tighter and identify problems sooner um, with manual handwritten um, control charts and hand calculations on them. So uh, definitely um, helped and, and it really did take off as a, a common and popular tool for improving quality. Now, what we saw there was the X bar and R chart, which is one type of a control chart. And the reason it's an X bar and R is because there was three subgroups, if you notice. You grab three bins from the line at the same point in the process at the same time, and then took samples from each of those bins and got three different readings, and then those were plotted. And the average and the, the max minus the min, those two values were plotted on the chart. So that's one example of a chart. Others could be like an individual's chart where you just plot a single value. So if she just taken one bin and plotted one reading, that would be an individual's. Or she could have taken five bins or 10 bins. And that could have been an X bar and S or standard deviation chart. There's also a whole set of charts for pass fail data or count data by counting up how many defects you have out of the total or uh, checking that your your pass fail rate of supplier deliveries or uh, resumes that have no issues on them. And you could trend that uh, defect rate or, or pass fail rate using a control chart. So lots of different ways to generate different types of charts. There's actually way more than that, but these are the common ones that you might run across. But I'm not going to go into all the mechanics of each control chart. I just want to focus on the application of what you do with these charts when you're plotting and recording data. Um, so the, one of the purposes of the chart is to understand the difference between your normal variability, the common cause, and the special cause. <clears throat> if you have a common cause variation, what that allows you to do is be predictable. And once you're predictable in a process, you know where your process is headed because you're going to have the same average and standard deviation that you had last. And then if we're predictable, we can decide, are we happy with those results? Is that giving us the quality and the performance we want? And if not, then we can make adjustments to our process and measure what happens. And so it's easy to see changes, whether our changes work in a process when it's common cause or just stable consistent process. But if I have the situation on the right where I have a lot of what we'll call special causes or lots of variation coming into the process, it's unstable. And what that does, is it makes it really hard to tell if when we make changes in our process, if they worked or not. Because you might, the process will move on its own. And so you might make a change to the process that makes it go up. And then the process went down on its own. And that canceled out your improvement, and now you can't measure whether you made a difference or not. So it's better if we can shift and get to a more stable process so when we do make adjustments or changes to get better results, we can see the direct impact of that. But if you have an unstable process, it's like chaotic, and you can't tell if what you're doing is working or not. So the first step is we want to get stable. And just like we would do with a lean improvement, we want to stabilize the process by putting in standards. Right? So everyone's doing things the same way. We cut down some of the, you know, the variability from everyone doing it their own way. So that's the same concept with control charts. So an example of common and special cause would be driving to work or commuting to work if you have to do that. It might take 25 minutes to get to work. And let's say we have a variation of about four minutes. So we'll give it plus or minus a couple of standard deviations and say your commute to work is about 15 to 35 minutes. Common cause would be the small fluctuations in your commute, like the wind speed and how fast you drive and whether you hit that one traffic light or not, how many cars are on the road, what time you left, whether it's raining or not. Um, special causes would be something that really disrupts your process. It takes you 45 minutes or an hour to get to work. In Portland, that could be a light snowstorm or uh, even rain. 
you would think wouldn't be a problem in Portland, but it does, right? People drive differently. But it's usually stuff like traffic accident or getting stopped by a train, pulled over for speeding, or your car breaks down. You can go back and say, had I not had that issue, I would have gotten to work in the normal fluctuation and the normal average and standard deviation that I usually get to work if it wasn't for that one assignable cause or special cause. So same thing happens in our processes. If we don't know what's going on, we don't know there's special causes there because we're not necessarily driving these processes, but the data tells us something happened. So if you're just looking at someone's commute time and all of a sudden you see the strange reading, you're gonna say, what happened? And that's the same thing with our charts is we wanna have the charts tell us when something's going on. And that allows us to ask questions and investigate. This is a little busy chart, but um, I took the picture I showed earlier of the control chart. These might be some readings we get from the uh, potato chip salt content data, and these would be data points plotted over time. There are certain properties of that data that if you're distribution of your data results look like a normal distribution or a bell curve, there are certain probabilities and percentages that go along with that. If you're one standard deviation within this, the average, 68% of the data should fall within that range. If you're two standard deviations, it's 95%. And three standard deviations is 99.7%. So that means almost 100% 100 of the data falls within three standard deviations. And that's why that number gets used quite a bit. Some other things about that that we can break down. In, in the control charts, they use something called zones. And these zones are colored here off the left. Zone C is the green area within one standard deviation. The yellow is two standard deviations. The orange is three. And outside of that would be uh, three or more standard deviations. And so we can use these probabilities over here in percentages with these zones and start to build some rules that help us define if the process is still looking like a normal distribution with the same average and standard deviation that we use to determine the control limits. So if you actually want to figure out based on these percentages, each of these little zone sections has a certain percentage of data that should fall within those zones. So for example, this orange area on the top there should be 2% of your data that falls inside of that zone if your process is stable. So if it does, if you don't see 2%, then your process might not be performing the same way as which you, in which you calculated your control limits originally. So that's an example where we would start to say, maybe my process is doing something different. 50% um, of the data should be above the average and 50% should be below. So if I see 30%, that should be a, a strange situation and it should raise a flag. And so that's the basis behind these rules that I'm going to go through. And I put a lot of references in here. I'm not going to talk through every single bullet point here, um, but just want to give you some information and I'll send out the slides so you can go back and look if you really want to dig deep into some of this. I actually learned quite a bit just putting this together. So it's pretty cool. So all of this starts from the Western Electric Statistical Quality Control Handbook of 1956. This was put together for Western Electric employees to help them apply statistical quality control and help with their manufacturing. Um, and they said they used the techniques developed in the 1920s by Dr. Walter Schuhart. And in that video, you heard him call it the Schuhart chart. That's another word for the control chart. Schuhart developed these methods that says you can monitor your process and help you identify these out of control conditions or um, situations that help you know if your process is changing and moving on you. They also mentioned in here a quality control team. So I thought that was really cool that they're really focused in on that this is not an individual or an engineer's job. It's a team effort for everybody to participate and learn about the process. And, and you saw that in the video. They had different people involved. One person record the data, another person would crunch the numbers and look for trends. And so 
they would even encourage you to have a team to problem solve and work through some of the issues that you find. Um, and they use this to help improve their quality. So there's a link to that handbook and you can read through it if you really want to nerd out. And I did read through a lot of it. It was really interesting. Um, there's stuff I hadn't even known about. So this is the breakdown of that document. But basically, they have some intro to S SQC, they call it, statistical quality control. Um, they have some stuff on process capability and designed experiments. Maybe our speaker next month will be covering some of those topics. And then there's a shop application for the operators and the people in the process. And then finally, a little section on inspection. But they're really focusing in on the process controls, not so much relying on the inspection afterwards. So in the document, it talked about these rules. Um, if there's an absence of points near the center line, that might be called a mixture is happening, some kind of uh, grouping or batching of, of work where the data kind of shifts around with each sample. You might see something called um, stratification if there's not many points um, near the control limits. That might be something to look for. Um, or patterns of data outside the control limits called instability. So they kind of use these general phrases at first. Then they came and put together actual rules. And so the first obvious rule is that you have a data point outside of the, of the three standard deviation control limits. And so that would tell us that if 99.7% of the data is within one standard deviation, then it would be unusual to see a data point outside of that. So if you see a data point, then maybe we should look at it to see if it's uh, an indication of a problem in our process. There's a very small chance it could just be a regular data point, but let's investigate and make sure. Then they have some other rules, two out of three beyond the two standard deviation line, four out of five beyond one standard deviation eight in a row on one side of the center line. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna deep dive into these a little bit, but those are the four that they called out in this document. They also mentioned these other ones about stratification, 15 points within one standard deviation, but they didn't give it a rule number. They just said it was just things to look for. Or eight in a row on one side um, that weren't in the middle. So they were like outside of the middle, you remember, like in the diagram, 68%, which would be in the middle, one standard deviation range. If you get eight points and none of them are in the middle, that's raising a flag. And then they have talked about the systematic variables and trends, but they didn't define out what that exactly meant. So there's a little um, subjectivity to whether you pick up a trend or not. Later in 1984, Lloyd Nelson published a short little document. It's only like three pages. Um, and he proposed defining those other four in a little more detail. Um, and so he kind of enhanced what was already there that had been around for you know, a couple of decades now. And he tweaked one of the rules. Number two, he changed it from eight, changed it to nine. He felt that was a, a good little improvement there. Um, but he also tried to get the probabilities to come out a little more close. So I think that's why he tweaked one of them. So these are the tests he came up with. Um, so any point outside the control limits, we've already seen that one. Nine on one side. They also included a trend as being six consecutive increasing or decreasing. So that's new. Two out of, two out of three. Um, basically two out of three that almost go out of the control limits. That's too many that are too close to going out of the control limits, so that should raise a flag. So that's got defined uh, four out of five in the same zone B or beyond, so outside of one standard deviation. Um, 14 consecutive points going up and down, 15 consecutive points in either of the zone C, so within one standard deviation, which actually might be a good thing, or someone's fudging the numbers, which I've seen before, or eight points in a row outside of C, either side uh, or one side of the center line. So 
these are uh, pictures in Wikipedia of what those look like. Okay, so outside of one is um, uh, one of the control limits. Those are examples on either side of it. The second one there, nine in a row above the average. Now, just, I gave a little bit of detail on some of these for how did they derive that? And the first one was obvious if you have 99.7% inside, then the chance of having one outside the control limits is 0.27%. Very small chance. So the logic behind these charts is that if you see a data point outside that has a very low probability of happening, it's a good idea to go investigate it because it wouldn't happen naturally in the process. You wouldn't see it very often. Now, when you go look for it, you might find out that was one of the rare times where it just happened on its own. It's possible, but usually it says our processes are trying to go uh, into some chaotic mode. We're trying to keep them from do going into uh, losing control. So usually it's probably an indication of some issue. Rule number two is nine in a row. And the way they get the probability for that is think about flipping a coin. You have a 50-50 chance of getting a heads. But if you were to see nine straight heads, if you flip the coin, that would be very unusual. In fact, it's only a 0.38% chance. Actually, it's a 0.19% chance of getting nine straight heads. So that would be rare. You'd have to flip it like thousands of times and try to get nine in a row. You won't do it. It probably take you hours or days to, to see that pattern show up. So if that happens in your process and your average splits the data in 50-50 and you see nine in a row on one side, they're saying that shouldn't happen. That's so unusual. Something must have happened in your process. It must have shifted upwards or downwards, whichever direction it went. Maybe it got miscalibrated. Maybe someone changed the settings. Maybe um, there was a little earthquake that put things off kilter. We don't know. So that's why we have to go look. And oftentimes what we'll find is something like that happened. And it may be subtle, but it might be enough to say that something's changed. And if we didn't fix it, it would have continued to get worse. until we eventually ran into problems or defects or failures. Okay, so that's how a lot of these rules are, are built is based on the likelihood of seeing this pattern if your process was stable and just running with the same average and the same standard deviation you had before. Or basically, how you, however you created your control limits. However you calculated those, if you pick up this pattern, it's saying maybe those aren't valid anymore. Maybe your process has changed or it's drifted away from where it used to be. So six in a row going up, 14 or more alternating. That's what that looks like. <clears throat> now you don't flag the problem until it hits, hits on that last one. So it's showing you the other ones that are there, but um, you don't actually flag it or stop the process till it lands there. And so, um, but, but it doesn't, it, it actually means that the problem probably started back here. So let's say these are hourly measurements in your process and you got to six in a row. Well, that was seven hours ago. So don't look for right now to see what's went wrong. Look at what happened in about seven or eight hours ago. That's when the problem started. We only were able to statistically pick it up in the chart, you know, after those many data points. But it, it originated much earlier. And so here are the calculations behind how you can get the six in a row. The actually rule of four is I couldn't figure out how they got there. So if anyone figures that out, can explain it to me. I didn't think it was going to be too complicated, but uh, I have a link in there to where they go through and explain that. But I was over my head or I'd have to re read it a little longer. Um, so part of the reason that this actually came up is I was teaching a class. 
I was using a different software than I usually use. Um, I usually teach with Minitab. Then I was asked to teach with JMP or Jump. And I noticed that it flagged something I'm not used to seeing in my, in my example data that I use in my class. And I actually reached out to them. I said, why did this one flag rule number three? Because it said six in a row, increasing or decreasing. And I said, in my mini tab, I was counting this as one, two, three, four, five, but no six. So I said, that's not enough. But here it's the same thing, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth one got flagged. And so they said, no, actually that's the way it's supposed to be. The rule is six, including the original data point. I said, I had no idea, I learned something new. So the percentages was based on it, what I would call five in a row going up or down. Um, but to me, they, they were calling that six, but I'm counting that as five. So the first data point I'm always including, but anyways, know which um, software may, may vary and, and determine which interpretation of some of these rules. But um, so that was pretty interesting. So I guess it is six, including the first data point, even if it's uh, not technically going down or going up. All right, rule five was two out of three. That's what that looks like. Um, rule six, four out of five. You can see that it looks like something's getting very close to going out of the control limits. And here you're getting a string of data points that are running pretty low. So you probably would see some of these patterns naturally. But what they were trying to do was build in some science to this and make it more uh, objective because we have a tendency to want to see trends in our data. We want to see patterns that are necessarily there. And so by defining these a little bit better, we can say, nope, it's only five in a row or it's only eight in a row is not to nine yet. Let's not do anything yet. Just keep an eye on. So just trying to make it a little easier to interpret. And here's some the data behind rule number five. Um, they actually come up with a, that paper came up with a different calculation and a different percentage. It's a little bit higher. Um, the easiest way I thought of it is there's two, two ways you can get um, in zone B or C based on those percentages I gave you. And then the other data point has to be outside of that range, which is one minus that number. And then you multiply those together, and there's three possibilities for doing that. So, so that's the simplest way to do it. Um, it may not be the technically right way now that I see it, but that's how the, the Western Electric book explained it. And that seems to make sense to me, but someone came up with a fancier way, and it's probably more correct and accurate. But um, the, the gist, I think, is, is pretty clear. Same with rule six. You got four out of five. There's a probability of four of them plus one minus the probability of not being in that range or that zone. And you multiply those all together, you get 0.27%. So you're seeing a lot of these with less than 1% chance of seeing the, that pattern if the process is running as it's supposed to be. And so when we see that, it could be a fluke, it could be a random data point that happens to show up, or it's an indication our process is having issues. And then rule seven is 15 in a row inside the standard, inside one standard deviation. That's too many inside one standard deviation, which could be a good thing. It could be that your process has less variation now. Or it could be like the example I had at my previous job where somebody started to cherry pick the data and just recorded the numbers they thought were the best. So they'd measure 10 times and record three numbers. And I said, no, that's not how the process works. You just have to record the first three measurements you get. Don't look for better numbers in the, on your sample. And when she went back to it, then the normal variation showed up on the chart again. So usually it's an indication of something good, but it could be that someone's changing the measurement system too. But it did the, the chart did the right thing and it flagged that something's changed. 
And that was true, but it wasn't the process. It was the way the person was inspecting. And then here's an example of eight in a row outside of the one standard deviation zone. And you see how it jumps up high and then jumps down low and nothing's in the middle. And two thirds of the data should be in the middle. So we get none of them in the middle. That raises a, a flag that something's not right. And you can also look at the pattern and, and it can kind of give you an idea of what might be happening. If you're seeing really high readings and really low readings, it's like maybe we're switching people. Maybe we're getting data off one machine and then getting data off another machine. Um, so the pattern itself often can give us some ideas of what might be going on. So that's another nice thing that it can provide to us. And if, you, if your chance of being within zone C is 68%, um, to do that 15 straight times, you only have a 0.3% chance of seeing 15 straight in that zone. And so again, that's that's too unusual. 12 straight, maybe. 10, not too uncommon, but not 15. And then the last one is outside of the zone C, you have a 31% chance of being outside that, but to have eight straight outside of that zone, unlikely, less than 0.01. That one seems a little bit too low compared to the other ones. They all, they all have been about 0.2, 0.3%. So I need to look at that one a little more closely. I think that might be too harsh or maybe the calculations are off on that one. Maybe seven outside of zone C is a, uh, a better indicator or maybe my math on here is wrong or something. But that one seemed unusually low chance. Okay, so any questions about the different rules before I wrap up with a couple other things? Are we doing okay on time, Maria? Yeah, we're doing fine on time. I don't have a question, but I appreciate the um, probability calculations behind the rules because I think maybe they just escaped my memory, but I think most of the time we're just taught like, this is the chart, this is what it is. And when you see the situation, something is wrong. Yeah. I don't think I was really uh, taught those either. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Yep. Are you using pretty much all rules simultaneously to find those variable, those variations for most projects? Or are you using certain rules at certain time, uh, depending on the situation? That's a good question. Um, one of my last slides, I'll mention that the more rules you turn on and check for, the more false alarms you're going to get too. Because each of these has a, basically that percentage is your false alarm rate. And so if you check for all eight rules, you will have more red dots and more flagged conditions pop up because by just odds and probability, you're increasing the chance of one of those false alarms happening. Uh, so what most people would say is start with rule one. That one's um, simple for people, and it it does catch major issues in your process. Um, and then um, depending on how sensitive you want to be, it's kind of a, a balancing act. The more rules you, you turn on, the more sensitive it will be. And um, But if you want to have more indications and not miss something, then You'll have more false alarms, but you'll catch them. So there's a little bit of trade-off there. Um, I usually turn them on when I'm doing investigation of my data and studying the process, but um, depending on the process itself, we might say, just check for these types of rules. Like the first four, I think, are, are standard across a lot of different types of charts, whereas the last four rules only really go with those individual and X bar and R charts. Um, so sometimes you'll have, with the other control charts, there aren't as many rules to turn on. So there's less false alarms on that. But I usually just stick to either rule one or I turn them all on usually and just know that there's going to be false alarms if you have them all on. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, there's also, 
a whole nother topic around capability that if your process is right against the edge of the specs, you might have to be caught. You want to know if your process drifts because that could cause problems. But if you have plenty of margin between your data and your spec limits, you don't have to catch your issues right away. You can kind of let the process shift and move around a little bit because you've got buffers built around it. So uh, that's another consideration is how close are you to the spec limits, which is kind of a whole nother topic. Maybe that's another future topic for next year, Six Sigma summer. <laughs> okay, so Toyota is kind of the model for a company that does process improvement very well. And their TPS system is a modeled by many different companies. Do they use control charts? Uh, they used to quite a bit. So Dr. Deming was a big proponent of control charts and he is um, the person most responsible and most credited with turning around the manufacturing in Japan. They love him over there and he turned them into a powerhouse so much that it created a whole revolution in the US trying to figure out what do we do to catch up? And that's where Six Sigma came from was uh, Motorola had to come up with a program to match what they were getting from their competitors in Japan and control charts and all the Six Sigma stuff were part of that. Um, so during those workshops, he taught SBC is a core concept. And there's examples and pictures and a couple articles I found that show pictures and diagrams of control charts being used in the 50s and 60s. And then it started to move into more machine controlled by the 80s. Um, but what you don't see a lot or what what people were saying is there's not a lot of evidence of control charts being used today. And I think what that is, is because of this quote down here by Art Smalley, he says, um, Toyota worked for decades to remove the common sources of variation for common and special causes, so much that their process controls were very high. And there's almost a transformation you go through with a control chart. You start without having any charts, then you add your control chart, then you find your special causes, then you start controlling your common cause a little bit. Then you cut back your sampling. So in that video, we had, they were sampling potato chips, I think every hour. If your process starts getting really good, you should go every two hours. And if that continues to look pretty good, go every four hours, maybe once a day, and maybe one bin a day instead of three. And you start cutting back so much that you're like, why are we doing this if our process is stable and in control? Probably because we have all the upfront controls in place that's keeping it in control. So tracking at the end doesn't make any sense now. We can quit doing this. And so you might actually get rid of or eliminate the chart at some point. And so you've almost come full circle. But going into a company, you don't know if they've already gone through the whole cycle and don't need the chart anymore or if they've never began in the first place. So I usually assume they've never begun. But I would believe that Toyota's probably gone pretty full circle and they don't need it very much because they have a lot of rigor around their standards and their structure and process controls. But for the rest of us, I think we probably have opportunities to use this kind of charts. Um, uh, probably technology has helped a bit too, where maybe we don't need it because the equipment's better and it has internal systems. I've seen control charts built into software and programs and machines. So it does some of this behind the scenes. People don't even know it. Like I've dug in and say, you, you actually have control charts working in there. It just doesn't tell you the, the light comes on red. That's derived from a control chart inside the machine, but you have no idea. So that's the other thing is it's maybe built in or baked in. And so the machines run better because they're using some of those concepts. And then this slide was just a statement of, um, is that Dustin's question about the mic? About the adding more rules increases the chance of false alarms. So if you turn on all the first six, there's a false alarm rate of two out of every 100 measurements will be a false alarm. And so that is the downside of of checking for all these different kinds of rules. That's all I wanted to cover. Um, questions about utilization of control charts or SBC. Is this something you've seen before? Is this something you've seen in other companies, previous companies, current company? 
Uh, I've seen this in my a previous manufacturer that I worked for, Wells Vehicle Electronics out of Wisconsin. Um, okay. They, uh, the it's a uh, low mix, high volume, so they really have um, instead of having to like go back and do rework on any of the boards that they build, they would just, you know, toss them and just dial in the process. So making sure that they're were, were dialed in pretty tight was was pretty key. So it's been a while since I've seen it. So it's a great catch up. Okay, great. We would do um, examples of this with, uh, we have conformal coat circuit boards and we would have the operators do a test coupon every morning. And they would paint it on what they think was the right thickness. And then we'd have them measure the coupon before and after they painted after it got baked. And then we would track their data to see if they could consistently paint on the thickness because we couldn't measure the product uh, after it was done because it could damage the product. So this was our way of trying to see if they knew how much thickness was the right amount. And if they started to get too heavy on the paintbrush, or too light on the paintbrush, then that would show up on the chart that says, hey, you're getting too thin. Remember, go back to the training or um, add a little bit more. You're, you're rushing too fast or, or you're glopping it on and, and that's too thick. That's wasting time and wasting material. So that was one application we had. And then we would test a lot of final product and run it through a series of tests. And we would pull out of the 300 tests we would run, we'd pick out some key ones and say, we're going to monitor the, the electrical performance of this product and, and trend that on a chart. And if that started to flag an issue, it would actually issue a stop ship. And we couldn't ship out the product until someone responded and reviewed the data points and made sure that there wasn't a problem. And there was one case where the product, uh, the measurement was in spec, but it was out of the control limits. And so it was due to be shipped out, but because it was outside the control limits, it was unusual. And what they found out is there was a real problem. And even though it didn't get flagged as a failure in the test, there was something wrong with the product. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a good example of how that could have avoided a, a major recall or issue with the customer. Any um, other questions? Brian, I, well, I was just going to, to answer to this question, I think I've seen this, I've seen the control charts used, but only really in people's black belt projects. <laughs> yeah. And then they never like really stick around after the fact as like a monitoring system. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to work is the project is supposed to launch the use of some of the tools of Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. And then those are supposed to be embedded as kind of like the first um, ev like first applications of that in the business so that people start to build from there. But if it's not put in place as a real process control, and I mean, that to do this, you have to train the people recording the data on what to do and how to read the charts. And with the software packages today, it'll flag these rule violations for you. You don't have to learn all that, but you still have to look at the chart and react to it. And some have mm -hmm. like email notifications and stuff like that that can kick in. So that's really nice. Mm -hmm. But then you also have to build it into your procedures. And there should be some kind of monitoring or auditing done to say, are we looking at this chart? Are we reacting to these out of control conditions? And what are we, how do, how, who's responsible for this? And yeah. if that's not established, then yeah, it falls apart. Do you have a suggested um, software that you use? The one that we use that was a pure SPC package was called Infinity QS. And okay. it was super user friendly for the operators. It is very simplified controls on the system it would flash the screen green yellow and red for issues okay if you didn't enter data it would flag an issue and then um, in our florida site that i worked at it would send out notifications to the engineer support team that said there was an out of control point identified and then we also had a homegrown system that we created I helped do like the technical part of it, but we, they had programmers and database people that would pull all of our test results into a system 
And then it would check every time the test result came in, it would crunch through and check for all these rule violations. And then also send out an email alert or a text. I think it was just email. Maybe they got to text by the time I left, but. And they would say, hey, we've detected a four out of five outside of one standard deviation. Go investigate and see what's going on. And then you could respond with comments on, I didn't find anything or, yep, we found blah, 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 what's going on. Or there was an issue with our fixture that was broke and we're going to get their fixture replaced. You know, so it started to move us in that direction. But the homegrown one was massive thing. The, the other program uh, worked really well. And that was set up for like a, um, uh, it was a, what do you call it? An automated um, piece part placement and soldering machine. So high volume, um, but it was just simplified for the operators and designed for that own purpose. If you try to use like the stat packages like Minitab or Jump or something, they're just not built for like live SPC applications, but you can create all the charts you want with that, those programs, but they're just not good for inline with uh, sticking onto a factory floor or into the process. Amanda has a question or hand raised. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, so kind of in that same line. So most of the places that I've worked with are not manufacturing. So when we've used control charts, they are generally with in the scope of a project. Hopefully it's not just the one project after they complete the training, <laughs> but uh, sometimes that's the case. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I see over and over again is I think, uh, especially outside of manufacturing or at least outside of manufacturing, I don't see as many of the statistical tools being um, utilized or, or being at the place with the maturity that companies can utilize them. However, the control chart kind of sits on that line to me. And I see a lot of um, value in people using control charts more frequently. But with it being in mini tab or in jump or in these like complicated systems yeah. that companies don't always want to invest in. Um, you know, I, I've used like SPC plugins and things into Excel, but do you have any recommendations for creating these in a way that like companies that aren't going to invest in mini tabs still have um, avenues that their, com that their um, staff can use to create control charts? Yeah, there are some cell templates. I think I have uh, one for the individual's chart like in Excel. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's easy. I'll dig up and send those maybe out to Maria and you can send them to everyone. Or maybe mm -hmm. if we're talking, I can dig one up. But um, so that's one option. The other thing is, uh, is if you take out the control limits and the rules, just trending mm -hmm. the data over time, I think is very powerful. Um, yeah. And so that's usually a starting point. Early in a project, they're just trying to baseline and figure out what's going on. I'll just say, Excel does that really well. You can just do a line chart and you can see patterns and you can see shifts in the data. It may or may not violate every rule and you don't have to check for that. And you're not really sure what the control limits are, but just plotting over time, that data is really powerful. So that they can do in any yeah. program and they'll pick up some, the obvious stuff there. This, this really helps to have the rules and the control limits when you start getting more refined and in more detail. Um, I had another coworker that came out of the semiconductor industry. She said every day they reviewed 200 control charts because they want, they had to stay on top of that. Um, it was so the precision and the performance and if those things drifted or shifted out of control, they were talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. So that's when those mm -hmm. control charts are really important and critical. But starting off, I think just trending the data over time is really I'm uh, going to pick up some obvious things and some easy things for them. But I'll look for the, the Excel templates. Those, there's some online too. I know you can search and probably find and download those. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I thank you for, uh, I was invited by my <clears throat> quality manager. And uh, you said this happens once a month? Yep. Yes. Every first Tuesday, different topic, different kind of activity each month, but it's okay. always related to Lean or Six Sigma. 
That's awesome. I expect to see myself here a bunch in the future. Awesome. Thanks for yeah, joining. Thanks for joining. Yeah. yeah. All right. Everybody have a wonderful That's day. Thank I you. Had. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everyone. I've got one. I've got one cool. more question for you, Brian. Okay. Go for um, it. So yeah, I I agree that like a lot of times just to start trend like tracking some data seeing the trends can be really powerful to people understand like how a process is performing yeah. um i might be opening a can of worms here but i'm thinking of like how do you choose like we look at these examples as dots right how do you choose what thing you're measuring because there's often you know and maybe we can use the circuit boards as a example that after the thing is printed and soldered and all the the parts are placed, it's too late. Yep. So, you know, if you're talking now, I'm mixing examples to go back to semiconductors that there's 200 different control charts that are probably leading variables into what might result in a defective unit at the end. Yeah. So I've heard the this other term used that like the handbook called statistical quality control. I've also heard that SQC is measuring the output of your process and monitoring it, like the salt content in the video. Mm -hmm. And then SPC would be monitoring an input factor, like um, the temperature of the oven yeah. as it's going through, which is more like inline as it's happening, or the conveyor speed of that little hopper as it's sifting the potato chips down the line. You're tracking the yeah. vibration of that to make sure that it's moving the chips properly and separating them out and stuff like that. So the goal is ultimately to get to where you're doing inputs to your process That's and monitoring true. that. Yeah. It's after the fact of the salt content is too late, but it could still flag process issues that let's say their salt content in the video had gone up. They could go back and yeah. say, oh, there's something wrong with our hopper. It's not been cl cleaned or preventive maintenance done on it like it's supposed to. It's getting clogged, and now we're getting clumps of these mm -hmm. salt getting dumped in there, or it's starting too much moisture is getting in there, and now mm -hmm. too much salt's getting in, and that's spiking our end result. So I usually say, like, let's have, like, some key things we're tracking on the back end, but ultimately, we should mm -hmm. always be trying to get back to process inputs what's going into the process and what's happening during the process that we can actually control. Cause you're right. It's too late at the end, but at least it's right. better than the customer finding out saying, Oh, this bag of chips. Tastes the fact, yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm also, now I'm thinking back to that one point that you had on that slide with the full cycle on the Toyota mm -hmm. slide where we don't have a chart. We add a chart, we, we fix all the things and then there's no chart again. I could yeah. also see that moving around on the inputs and the outputs, like because you're yes. in the beginning, you're kind of searching for the the right thing to measure around. You know, is it the salt? It's, is it the conveyor it's this speed? Common is it the cause controlling yeah. the common cause. That is really yeah. that process inputs um, is saying before every time we see this mm -hmm. chart act up, it's because this one thing doesn't get done right, or we forget to clean out this trap yeah. or we forget to, um, you know, switch out this tool or we have been pushing this machine longer than it's supposed to. And yep, here we go. It's starting mm -hmm. to have problems again. Um, and so, yeah, you get into now the inputs that you're controlling better. Yep. Great. Uh, probably pretty fundamental, maybe leading to a, a bunny trail here, but uh i'm pretty new at this so what do you do if you don't have normal distribution or where do you start good question so um yeah a lot of the rules were are derived out of that normal distribution one advantage is the x bar and r chart like in the video does not require a normal distribution on your the data of that you're collecting there's a, a um, central limit theorem that kicks in basically and when you do the subgroups of three or five or 10, it actually converges your data to a normal distribution. It's a very interesting theory that, that happens, but the X bar and R chart doesn't care what your original data distribution looks like. The individual's chart 
is sensitive to non-normal distributions, the more non-normal it is, the worse it's going to perform. So if it's a little bit off, it's probably going to perform pretty well. If it's way off, it'll flag a lot of false alarms and miss some things. Um, there are other charts you can use for those non-normal distributions. Um, you can also transform data if that's applicable, but that gets a little messy. Um, so usually I recommend is try and figure out a way to do subgroups so that the distribution doesn't matter and you can mm -hmm. leverage this central limit theorem principle to um, make it work for you. Um, but then you could, there's other things we could do with like, um, like some of the range charts actually are non-normal distributions too, and they only flag the first four rules. And so the way that those were calculated, you could leverage something like that, but that gets into a lot of those other types of control terms. But there's usually um, a solution out there for whatever data type and distribution you've got. Yeah, great. Thanks for going there. Appreciate it. Yep. Good question. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, really appreciate this. I think it's always fun to kind of deep dive into the math behind some of these uh, tools that we might see on a regular basis. Um, so just one last question for the group. Usually now we kind of like switch from the topic to just general networking, or I'm also taking requests for uh, anything Six Sigma focused for August. We have something planned for, Ju no wait, for September. We have something planned for August, um, but still looking for a topic for um, September. So if you have a suggestion, please let me know. You can also reach us by email at leanportland at gmail.com. Sweet. Sweet. Thank you again. That's sweet. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Glad you could join us. And Brian, you're going to, do you want to send the slides to me and then I'll, I can send them out to the group. Does that work for you? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yet. And I'll, um, I want to dig up those templates too. See Template? I, awesome. got, I know I have the individual yeah. chart. I don't know if I have the X bar. X bar R. I mean, let me look. Okay. Well, thanks. And I the Excel this... program, the plugin that I've been using is the Sigma Excel. Just to... Sigma Excel. Okay. Yeah, Sigma Excel and QI macros, they're like mm -hmm. 200, 300 bucks and they're add-ins to Excel. They do a lot of, of the same features. So they're not very expensive versus the mm -hmm. 1500 to 2000 bucks for those other packages. They're a little yeah. pricey. Well, great. Great to see you all. Hope yeah. to see you again next month. Thank you. Bye. I had a... One more question uh, about Lean Portland. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is my first meeting or first meetup for this. I was wondering, I had read about the uh, community project and volunteering for those. Would, those, yeah. would that be possible to volunteer from that from uh, remotely? Mm. That's a really good question. And Dominic, who was here earlier, he had to uh -huh. he had to jump off for another meeting. He's in Pennsylvania, and he's been trying to figure out the same thing. So. We are talking about it. So um, if you haven't already, maybe sign up for our newsletter because when we do figure something out, we'll be sending out information about how to sign up. Okay, yeah, very cool. Thank you. That's an, actually, I've yeah. got a name for you. Um, Michelle, I'll have to look up her last name, but we're trying to get a Lean Bay Area group going. Oh, great, so I've yeah. Got two, two people that are kind of, they want to get it going, but we haven't gotten very far yet. Um, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get you in touch. Um, can you put in, maybe put in your email and then I'll connect you up with her. Okay. And maybe what yeah, we should I, I can do, do that. Uh, what we should think about Brian, cause there was a couple of other, I know some people in New Jersey and then there was the Wisconsin group that we've talked to before. If we figure out to, how to do something remotely and what we were thinking was like, let's just make some standard instructions. Mm -hmm. And then in your local area, go and volunteer for something. And we kind of do like a group reflection oh. on mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. after the fact. So yeah. that way we don't have to organize everything, but um, people still have a chance to take my process improvement brain <laughs> and put it outside. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
That's a good idea. Yeah, Brian, I'll, uh, I'm driving right now, but I'll, I took a okay. screenshot of your contact info, and I'll send you an email and ask for maybe Michelle's email address through that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks again, y'all. This is, this is okay. fantastic. A lot. All right. Thanks yeah, for joining. Have a good one. Thanks, Dustin. And always great to see you again, Brian, Amanda. Yeah. All too. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like we had Australia on the line for a minute. Yeah, he was that? here. Yeah, he was here a couple months ago, maybe. Oh, nice. Too. So he came back. Great. Nice. All right. We'll see you later. All right. Okay. Talk to you soon. Okay. okay. You too. Bye. Bye.